No. So um, it's very interesting to see what's happened since. So I'm really looking forward to um, Char uh, Charlie's talk because since then he's completed his PhD, correct? Yep. Which uh, I'm, Call me doctor. Still be I'm still being chased. <laughs> And, um, and uh, he has done uh, various different things um, which are to do with the music industry and then to do with research as well. So there's a crossover there, which um, I'd like you to welcome, Charlie Inskip. Okay, thanks, Michaela. Thanks for inviting me to take part in this fantastic festival of ideas. Um, as you've just heard, I used to work in the music industry. I was a manager of various bands. I did publicity and PR for many years. And then I decided I wanted to be a librarian. It's maybe easier to manage information than musicians. Maybe that's one of my rationales. I worked at City University, studying with the MIG group a little bit um, in my library studies. And I, my PhD was looking at how music is organized for use in films, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Not just what I did in my studies, but how I connected that to industry and professional practice. Hmm. Okay, this is a little bit smaller than I imagined it would be. I'm going to talk about the use of pre-existing commercial music in film, television, advertising, and computer games. There's a lot of work being done in the music industry getting songs placed in television and into movies by music supervisors and specialist music searchers. I looked at the, re the communication between the rights holders, the record companies and the music publishers, and the researchers and film people, and I found there was a mismatch between the way these people were communicating specifically about music. And this causes difficulties if you're trying to construct an automated music search catalog for this purpose. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I did, and I'm going to stress really the importance of talking to, thank you, talking to the users, talking to the users who've just vanished into the haze, um, when you are designing apps to work for them. If you don't know what the way that they think about stuff, then they're probably not going to use your system. So walk through. I'm going to talk about music synchronization, tell you how I define that. I'm going to tell you that things are not always as they seem. And I'm going to talk about the problem of language. I'm going to talk about putting theory into practice. And briefly, where do we go from here? Music is used in films. If you turn off the sound on your TV, you will notice there is no music going on. If you listen, while not watching TV, there is music going on all of the time. It is very unusual for you not to have music going on in the background doing TV broadcast. This is the same in movies. You go to a movie without any music, you're really going to notice that and wonder where the music went. It's an important part. It has been ever since the dawn of the silent movie, which wasn't quite so silent because there was someone playing the piano along to the projector. The music exists within itself, but it interacts with the film and it enhances the meaning. And that meaning is transmitted through agreed cultural codes. You might hear a piece in a major key. That probably means there's something happy going on. If it's in a minor key, it might mean there's something sad going on. That kind of idea. If you've got consonance or dissonance, if the music is all jarring against each other, like in lots of Hitchcock movies, then that's going to make you feel tense. If it's all mellifluous, and harmonic, then perhaps it's going to make you feel a little bit more relaxed. The music does enhance the narrative. If you use pre-existing music, popular music that you can buy in the stores and download from iTunes in your soundtracks, and this is particularly the case in advertising, but also in movies by Danny Boyle and Quentin Tarantino, these kind of movies, they don't have scores written for them. They use existing popular music because those pieces have a particular meaning to the viewer that can enhance their experience. But, as someone mentioned earlier, what you think about that track might be very different from what you think about that track because you might not have heard it before. So, these meanings are variable and they're changing. This is a very important revenue source for the music industry. You can't imagine how much money they make from getting their songs placed in TV commercials and advertising so, and movies. So they make great efforts to make this use. It's not really about the promo, it's about the revenue. 
Going right back to the silent movies, there's the Keystone Cops, 1924, Ernest Rappé wrote a catalogue of music to be used while you're playing the piano to the silent movies. He identified these themes, happiness, horror, orgy, monotony, neutral, oriental, all sorts of stuff he extracted from his understanding of that music and he gave a guide to the piano player in the old movie theater. This is the tune to play when there's something scary happening, when there's something sad happening. He identified these important facets. I was looking at that and I did lots of interviews with music publishers and record companies and filmmakers and advertising people and there are a lot of stakeholders and they've all got different motives. So when you are putting together an ad and putting the music in there, you've got a creative team who write the script. They're probably in their 20s and whatever music they're into, if it's hip hop, electronica, grime, they want that on the ad. That's one stakeholder. You get a creative director who's a generation older, he wants something he's never heard on an ad before. You get the client who wants some classical music or some jazz, and you've got Debbie the housewife who's the target market and she's into madness. So what kind of, what piece of music do you use? Who do you satisfy? Do you satisfy the client or the creative director or the target market? It's difficult to choose when you don't know what, who's the most important person in that process. There are also very confusing briefs and queries. You're not using one word queries when you're looking for a piece of music for an ad. You're using a page of A4 to describe what it is you're looking for and you're never gonna mention artist and title. Forget artist and title when you're cataloging music. It's not about that. You're gonna get a brief that might say this is for a car, okay, a car ad. The first ad should emphasize the performance quality of the car. Thank you. It should pick up on aspects of the car's speed, power, control, and ability. The music doesn't necessarily have to correspond with these in pace and energy, but should hint at them through instrumentation. There's a query for a piece of music for a car ad. Go and put that into a search engine and see what you come up with. It's not going to come up with some very useful results. There's no artist and there's no title and there's no genre. It's all about the more important facets that are being used by these film, paper, film people. They might look at the beauty, sophistication, and intricacy of the design, and calm music, and pleasure music. Perhaps these will be available on the website for you to look at later. I'll use them as a prompt, that's okay. So, and there's a huge amount of subjectivity. What I think is the right music for your ad might be different from what you think is the right music for your ad, and in the end, 10 different pieces might be the right music, and it's down to negotiation between the people. So you can't just build a one empty box search engine to find music for this type of purpose. I identified when I was analyzing these interviews and lengthy queries, I gathered lots of them and I looked at the web search engines that have been developed for this purpose, and I found that there were four different ways people were using to talk about what music is. Okay, what is music? If you're a record company person, you might think of music as being something which is created, it's got identifiable characteristics, artist, song title, writer, year, album, that kind of metadata we're all familiar with that's in iTunes. You also might use the business way of thinking about music where you've got a large collection of recordings which are marketable, contractual and re negotiable and have monetary value. This is not about music as a listening, it's about music that you can make money out of. Words they're using are brand new and catalog and comprehensive and demographic. If you're a film person, or if you're using that process, then you might use the soundtrack repertoire way of thinking about music. And so you're going to think about music as a mood-enhancing ingredient that's linked to the message that's being conveyed by the moving image. And you're going to use words like effervescent, uplifting, recessive, theme, quirky, with a bit of a build, these kind of words to talk about your music. Or you might just think, use the cultural way of thinking, I like music because it's good, it's exciting. It's great, I hate it, it just works. These four different ways of thinking about music, musical, business, soundtrack, and cultural, can be used to inform my model, which is flicking on and off there, of how this communication process takes place between the rights holders and the 
users, the creative professionals who are searching for the music. So they use their ways of thinking about music and their ways of thinking about the world to communicate and reach some kind of satisfactory result in their search. And their queries are encoded by their ways of thinking. So what I say when I'm saying, okay, I'm a filmmaker, I want this uplifting and quirky with a bit of a build piece of music, my understanding of what uplifting, quirky, and a bit of a build means is going to be interpreted by the record company in a certain way based on the way they understand how that process happens. And if you're going to build a search engine that reflects that process, you need to know what that language is so that you can help them find the music they're looking for. That was my PhD. It took a bit longer than 10 minutes to talk about. It took me three or four years to do. Then I went to the record companies that I used to work for when I was, or work with, when I was managing bands and doing publicity. And I went to a label called One Little Indian, which is the home of Bjork and various other artists, an independent label, three and a half thousand song catalog. They said, great, we want you to catalog our music so that we can find it easily for use in music synchronization. Here's links to all the songs, go off and sort it out. Great, I thought. So, three and a half thousand songs. I listened to three and a half thousand songs over about three months. Okay, this is manual cataloging. This is not automatic. I'm sure that my friends over at City and others amongst you could now develop processes that would help me do this in a lot shorter time. But now I've got a ground truth, which we all know is very useful. I looked at the metadata that was already there, which was all the stuff about the assets and the artist and the title, all the stuff I knew that we weren't going to need for using music in films. And I identified various other metadata that I would have to generate. And that was, how long is the intro? How long is the outro? Where is the middle eight? Is there an instrumental break? Is it a male or female vocalist? What is the mood of that piece? Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it fat? Is it thin? These kind of things, taken from the words that came out of my interviews, the way creative people in the film and advertising industries were thinking about music. And I used their words to inform a cataloging scheme that I used against this set of three and a half thousand songs. I'd love to show it to you, but I've kind of described it in its... You know, I've, got to, I've just remembered just about all of them, I think. Oh, have I got it here? No. So, it's died. Okay, let me just get my notes. We're going to go analog on you. Paper doesn't die. Okay, 500 years from now, I'll be able to look at this. You won't be able to look at a PDF in 500 years' time. I can tell you that for nothing. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mood was particularly interesting in the music information retrieval research community because it is really fuzzy and no one can agree on anything. So what people use to analyze mood in music is they use an old psychology theory from the 1980s, the circumplex model of affect, which is an XY axis, which has got stress going up and down and mood going left and right. So if you've got, if you're up there on the lots of Y's and lots of X's, then oh, uh, uh, up here, that's really happy. Down here, you're just about to slash your wrists. Up here, you're getting really, really angry. And down here, you're really, really chilled out. Okay? So you've got four quadrants. I listened to the music. I located on these quadrants using vectors to help me work out where these pieces should lie and to determine the effect of that mood. That now I'm looking at different words to identify those moods that will reflect the language that is being used in that process. And this database that I generated is being used within that record company to help identify music that is being sought by film and advertising professionals for use in their work. So, from PhD to professional practice, there are some logical steps to be made. It can be a bit frustrating. In the real business world, things move a little bit slower than you would like. Things are very much less out of your control than you can imagine. 
developing a catalog manually and orally over three months of listening to three and a half thousand songs is a slow process, granted. There is a little element of subjectivity there. There is some consistency queries, although the use of the grid helps to maintain that consistency. So I think that I've developed a taxonomy that is a starting point for work, for further work in this area. I'm looking at doing some more work in that over the next year or two. It did mean that I could go through the whole database and identify duplicates and missing links and misspellings and all other stuff that was in there as well, so there was some added value there. And now we're going to look at completing the development of that web app. Now it's been used just in-house as a spreadsheet for a few months. We're getting a feel for what works, what is useful, what are the gaps. And we're going to refine that a little bit further and make it into a web app so that the users can come straight to that and find music that reflects their query, which, as you remember, might be very complex. It would be great if I could do that all the time, but I know that people like City and all sorts of other universities are developing apps that can do that automatically, that cataloging. And I would love to speak to any of them about any developments and possible collaborations that can be done in the future. Thank you very much for your tolerance with my lack of slides, never mind. I hope I got that message across to you. If you want to talk any further, come and find me, or you can email me inskipcharles at gmail.com. Any questions? Any questions for Charlie, guys? Uh, thank you, Charlie, for rescuing the presentation without the slides. Thank you. It's probably been fixed.